Hi, I'm in a new place again today. You never know where I'll show up. But gratefully, we're here to do week three, and I'm in Monica's office. Monica is our pastor here at Carthage United Methodist Church, and it's pouring rain outside, and she has graciously volunteered to tutor me yet again in the history and physics of technology. I don't know. I don't, it's, you know, I'm a pen and paper kind of girl. But we are on week three. I'm glad to be here with you. I hope that you're enjoying this online. I hope that it is afflicting the comfortable and making the uncomfortable afflicted. That didn't even come out right, but you know what I'm saying. I hope the Word of God is getting into you and you are getting into the Word because this study is all about Jesus is better than anything. Better than anything you would leave behind for him. Better than anything that you would have to offer. Jesus is better. So here we go. We're going to start if you've got your workbook, and I hope you do. We have two more left, by the way, in the office. If you're interested, we have two more left. We can keep those and send them to you, or we can mail them back. But uh, just FYI, if you're looking for a book and need one. Page 35, I'm going to read this because this covered pretty well what, uh, uh, what we needed to start with. Having established Jesus' superiority over the angels in chapters 1 and 2, we now move forward with the message of how the Old Testament finds its fulfillment in Christ. Now remember the original Jewish audience who now, some of them were converting to Christianity, they had no role models. They were it. They were their own role models. They were figuring out as they went along because this was new. Remember, to them, Moses would have been it. He would have been who they revered, who they had built their foundation on, and rightfully so. Moses was a man of God. Moses, there is so much on his resume, it would be hard to recite it all. And yet Moses was human. And that's the point that the author of this study and the author of the book of Hebrews makes. Jesus is better. So I'm going to turn a page, if you want to join me, starting on 36. And I'm going to read in Hebrews 3, starting at the verse 1, my subtitle says, Jesus is greater than Moses. And so, dear brothers and sisters who belong to God and are partners with those called to heaven, think carefully about this Jesus, whom we declare to be God's messenger. For he was faithful to God who appointed him just as Moses served faithfully when he was entrusted with God's entire power. But Jesus deserves far more glory than Moses, just as a person who builds a house deserves more praise than the house itself. Moses was certainly faithful in God's house as a servant. His work was an illustration of the truths that God would reveal later. But Christ, as the Son, is in charge of God's entire house. And we are that house. If we keep our courage and remain confident in our hope in Christ. You will hear those words repeated over and over. Again, if you're reading in the study book or if you're reading in your Bible, what follows next is what we have read several times already. Psalm 95. Today, when you hear his voice, don't harden your heart as Israel did. Talks about the ancestors 
And I encourage you to look at Psalm 95. It talks about they hardened their heart at Meribah and Massa. And, you know, I was thinking as I was reading it, what did they do that was so bad that it keeps being repeated in Psalm 95 and now it's repeated in the New Testament? What did they do? So I go all the way back to Psalm 95, which then takes me all the way back to Numbers, which then takes me to their history and their problem. Now the Israelites, you know, Moses had brought them out. He was the hero. He was the foundation. He had been obedient to God. But now we have the Israelites wandering around, and they begin to whine and they begin to complain, and they begin to fuss, because, well, there's no water, and there's no food, and it's hot, and we're uncomfortable, and we wanna go home, and maybe you could just show us how to get back to Egypt, because then, at least we had some food and water there. So, Moses is fed up with them. God is fed up with them, because they won't hush, and they don't get that God is faithful. Remember in Hebrews, remember there are five warnings that we're going to talk about in the book. Remember the first one was last week. It was in chapter two. The warning to pay attention and not drift away. We get our second warning today and it's found in three, chapter three, verse seven. Today, when you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Warning against unbelief. Warning against disobedience. Warning against not trusting that God will do what God says he will do. And the Israelites had been not trusting for quite a while. So we have one incident where God tells Moses, take your staff, take your stick, strike a rock, water will come from it. And he does, and water comes from it. And that's great. But as you would see later on in the lesson, again, you see a theme here with the Israelites, and it's a theme that carries on today for all of us. You see the Israelites start to whine again. There's no food, there's no water, we're tired, we're fat, we're hungry, we're, uh, we just can't go on, we're so uncomfortable. God tells Moses this time, speak to the rock and the water will come out. Now why Moses didn't do that, we don't know. Maybe he thought the first time I got to strike it, so God won't mind if I strike it again. Maybe he thought, hey, I was pretty good at it the first time, so I'm going to do it the next time. The point being, he disobeyed, and he struck the rock twice, and water came out, but God's anger came out, and God said, you disobeyed. You didn't do what I said do. You did not have the confidence in me to believe that I would do what I said I would do. That is where Moses lost his inheritance to the promised land. Now, Moses is still the child of God. Moses will still be with God, and yet he does not have the right to enter the promised land. So we go on. Days two and three look more closely at Hebrews three and four we start to see that Moses was entrusted with God's house, but the writer begins to make the point, Moses was a servant. Jesus is the son. Jesus is the heir. He is better than anything. Remember last week, Jesus is better than the angels. He is better. The angels are ministering spirits. They are ministering servants but they are not the heir. Now we see that Moses is a servant. And you know, this had to catch them by surprise. 
Moses had been their foundation. And so all of a sudden, Moses is not it. But these were already people who had been influenced by this person of Jesus. They had already fallen in love with this man named Jesus whom they saw crucified, but then they have also seen as he rose from the dead. And now they're following him, but it's coming at a cost. It's coming at a cost of persecution. You know, we want to do what Jesus would do. You know those bracelets, what would Jesus do? So here's my story to that. We can't do what Jesus would do if we don't live like Jesus lived. And we can't live like Jesus lived if we don't get in the Word of God. That's the only way we can do it. So Hebrews days 3, 4, and 5. They continue to discuss the Israelites, the ones that lost their disobedience, or I'm sorry, the ones that lost because of their disobedience, the right to enter the promised land. But we hear the good news that this man named Jesus promises a rest for those of us who are in him. Not a physical rest, but a soul rest for those who are weary. Just as the Israelites were promised a physical rest in the promised land, we are promised a soul rest. If we do not lose courage and remain confident, so I ask you, as you've studied this and as you continue to study it, one question I want you to think about this week, and she has asked that. And this contains the wonderfully true and sometimes uncomfortable passage. For the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God. Everything is naked and exposed before his eyes, and he is the one to whom we are accountable. As you think about the word of God working in your life, I invite you to ask him to do that. It may not be pleasant for the moment, but that's not what we're going for. We're going for that rest, that soul rest, because Jesus is better than anything we would leave behind. I want to close with a prayer. I did not write it. I found it on Facebook, of all things. Sometimes there are good things. And would you receive this as we close? May God himself restore to you something you lost and never thought you'd get back again. May he heal a soul wound that you thought you'd never get over. May he pour out an abundance of joy and hope that makes you celebrate even before the answer comes. And may a thriving, rich faith mark your life in every way. You have access to the Most High God. Live accordingly. We have access to the Most High God. Let's live accordingly. Amen.